Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to see all of you in December, um, before the holidays begin. So if I fail to say it at the end of the meeting, let me say it at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I want to wish you all a very healthy and a happy holiday season and a 2020 in which we see justice in which we see fairness, in which we see a reduction of hate, and we see, I hope, a country coming together. So that's what I wish all of you for 2020. Healthy families, joyful families, a lot of laughter, and a lot of good times. So you all have the agenda in front of you. We have a busy agenda, and the number of trades that we're going to be looking at today. What I'd like to do, is to have the council introduce themselves um, and then have all of you <coughs> introduce yourselves um, and then I will turn it over to the commissioner for her greetings as well. So, council? Uh, Stuart O'Brien, New York City Association of Contracting Plumbers. Bernie Hartman with the electrical workers. Jeff Huffcutt, Southern Tier Sheet Metal Contractors Association in Binghamton. Bill Maggioni, uh, New England Carpenters, soon to be uh, North Atlantic Carpenters. And I, for uh, district council. And I forgot to say, I had to say that in six months they're going to change their change name. <laughs> well, they couldn't be New England. Like New, New York, York is not New England. Can't keep up. Can't keep up. Can't keep up in our files. So I, I'm from Cornell University, the School of Industrial and Relations, and I direct the Labor and Employment Law Program and the Criminal Justice and Employment Program. Good morning, I'm Commissioner Reardon from the Department of Labor. Good morning, my name's Natalie Carey, I'm the Executive Deputy Commissioner for the New York State Department of Labor. And welcome to your first yeah. meeting. Yeah. I want to come back every time. Every time. Every time. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, Karen Coleman, Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development and Governor's Office Advisor for Workforce Policy and Innovation. Uh, Jane Thompson, Director of Apprenticeship Training. Uh, Mike Pauliolonga, Deputy Counsel for the Department of Labor. Okay, and now it's your turn. So why don't we start over here? Chris Lambert with the Electricians. <coughs> Larry Warzik, Sheet Metal Workers, Local 83. Don Kraft, Sheet Metal Workers, Local 112. Patrick Peterson, Operating Engineers, Local 15, New York City. Tom Gordon, Operating Engineers, Local 14, New York City. <coughs> Jim Haggerty, Elevator Constructors, Local 35. <coughs> Mark Studo, Heat and Frost Insulators, Local 40. Dave Patner, Heat and Frost Insulators, Local 40. Uh, Roy Casey, Finishing Trades Institute, Local 201. Aaron DeVolt, Local 267, Homer 16 Thirds. Uh, Steve Fitt is Local 638, Steve Water. Ken Potter, United Association, Training Director, Level Hudson Valley. Ellie Spicer, Pathways to Apprenticeship. New York Castagnoli, Cement Mason, Plasters, New York City. Michael Holdman, Local 780 and 262. Lisa McGuire, Apprenticeship Training. Bill Gerard, Apprenticeship Training. And the first show here will be listed. Yes, Stephen Traver with Warren Washington, Albany County, Chapter of the Art, New York. Lake Sagas, uh, Prevention Training Central Office, New York State Department of Jill Hunter, Eastern Department of Education. Uh, Dan Evans, New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. Kathy, why don't we start with you with the other side? Kathy Reardon, Department of Labor Office of Apprenticeship Control. Jenna Rosen, Department of Labor and Prevention Training. John Mannion, New York State Education Department. Amir Khanna, New York State Education Department. Tim Jones, New York State Education Face, Fly Graphics, Saratoga Springs, and Mechanical Apprenticeship. Steve Bukowski, Saratoga Springs, Fly Graphics, Plant Maintenance Electrician. Stephanie Allen, Fly Graphics, Saratoga Springs, and the Senior Interpreters Department. Lee Reynolds, New York DOL Rec. Bill Austin, Plumbers and Steam Fitters, Local 773. Paul I. Garino, Building Trades Education Fund. Penny Hazard, Merritt Alliance. Uh, Tom Studer, Training Coordinator for Plumbers and Pipe Fitters, Local 112 in Binghamton. Alexis Flewelling, Office Professional for the United Association of Plumbers Local 773 in Glens Falls. Jacob Ringer, Training Coordinator for Local 773 Plumbers and Steam Fitters, Glens Falls. Patrick Lynn, uh, Training Director for Operating Engineers Local 30, New York City. 
Anthony Davey, Chief Academic Officer, Quest R3 BOCES. Denise Fernandez Palazzi, Quest R3 BOCES, Director for Career and Technical Education. Jeff Guy, Buff State Labor Affairs, DOL. Chris Alon, Labor Department, Public Work. Frank Schweizer, Labor's Local 1298, Road and Rich Bogardis, Department of Local 291, Training Coordinator. Mike Lyons, Operating Engineer, Local 158. Bill and Greg, Operating Engineer, Local 158. Bill Schneider, Local uh, Operating Engineer, Local 137, Mark McMahon. Bill Edwards, IBW, Local 263. Carrie Chesterfield, IBW 236, Training Workers. Cody Miller, Local 234. Brian Keating, Local 355, Director of Training. Kevin Potter, uh, for Clayton Local. And the gentleman who came in. Ricky Lyons, one of the Deputy Executive Director. Great. Is there anybody we missed? Oh, back there. Okay. South Salvatore Camisso, Labor's Local 190. Which is one of New York City College Training. Mm -hmm. Peter Bennett, Director of Training, New York City District Council Coffee Training. George Chuck, IBW Local 3, New York City, Training Director. Okay. I think that's it. Did we get everybody? Okay. So, Commissioner? Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Natali. Good morning, and thank you all for taking the time out of your extremely busy day to come here. I know this is a tough season to squeeze in one more meeting, and we're not serving any eggnog or any cookies, but, you know, we're really glad to have you here with us. This is a really really important group and again thank you for your commitment to the registered apprenticeship programs that we have here in New York State it is uh, it is one of my favorite parts of the DOL and I always look forward to working with each and every one of you because I know how important these programs are to you and the men and women that you represent and the students who come through your programs uh, as many of you know November was uh, we celebrated registered apprenticeship week and Governor Cuomo designated that week New York State Registered Apprenticeship Week, so we decided to do something big. Jane and I spent the week on a whirlwind tour, and I do mean whirlwind, uh, of the state. We visited eight different programs. We attended a press conference, a training conference, and the Mason Tender Celebration of Women in Apprenticeship was our last visit of the week on Thursday night, I think. It was Sunday through Thursday. Um, and if, for if you have not seen the video that our communications department put together, we're going to show it to you right now. So let the video roll. <laughs> okay. I hear it. It's fabulous. <laughs> is great, but it's even better when you can see the, the videos. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, here we go. One more time. Nope, that's the middle of it. So this used to happen when I, at my union, we used to laugh because we were the entertainment union. And <laughs> that was uh, okay, here, here we go.
So as you can tell, it was a very, very busy week, and that Women in Apprenticeship uh, event that the laborers put on was, it was like going onto a movie set. So the apprentices erected the scaffolding, and then when we walked on, the stage was one, one flight up, and they were ringing around it, and it was, it gives me chills. They, they really did a great job. So it was really a fun, fun way to end our week. And thank you, Jane, for putting up with me for all of this. <laughs> It really I'm was. Surprised, no, we were not necessarily <laughs> prepared because I had gotten my new shoes. <laughs> 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 for this, no one got there. Yes, we <laughs> arrived in the snow and drove into more snow, so it was, uh, but it was great, and it's wonderful to see the enthusiasm of the apprentices across the state and the employers and the and the variety, as you could tell from from that video. We went to a lot of different places, and, and you know, I visit my union brothers and sisters all the time, but I don't often get a chance to see the, the, the other smaller apprenticeship programs, and so it was great to see it. Uh, you know, we are increasing the number of women in apprenticeships across the state. This was one of Governor Cuomo's initiatives last year, and I'm very happy to say that those numbers are moving up in the right direction. Every day we have our eyes on this goal of diversifying apprenticeships across the state, and I'm really happy. When I go to apprenticeship graduations, I always see diverse faces, and that speaks volumes to the dedication of the training programs and, and making sure that, that our training programs look like the communities where we live and work. So thank you for doing that. We all know that apprenticeships are a perfect way for young people, or even not quite so young people, to get a pathway to a good career and a middle class life. Natalia is now leaving because she's in the middle of state of the state preparations. So thank you. <laughs> she's a very busy woman, but I wanted her to come down and see you because I talk about apprenticeships all the time. And she wants to get to know the program better. So that's a great way to do it. You know, there was an article in the news, I think it was yesterday, about the uh, employment stats here in the capital region. And they were saying how hard it is for employers to find well-trained workforce. And I hear it all the time. And I have to say what you all know, that apprenticeships are such an excellent way to make sure that there's a strong, dedicated pipeline of workers who are trained to the specifics of your industry, well-trained. They have a certificate when they finish. And that's one of the reasons we do so much work out on the road, encouraging new employers to take on apprenticeships. Because in a tight labor market, people are competing. And what's a better way to hold on to your employee to them to invest in them. So I know I'm singing to the choir here. You're all here because you have apprenticeships. But it's a program that we're really, really proud of. And you should be very proud of, too. Um, there are exciting things that are happening in these programs. Um, we are committed to taking the gold standard that the building trades established decades ago in these training programs and expanding it out into a broader audience. And those are the conversations we get to have here all the time. Uh, we really have an exciting uh, year that we're wrapping up. So this year was our very first New York State Registered Apprenticeship Summit. And I look around the room and I see many of you were there. I want to thank you for participating. Uh, it was a really exciting program. A lot of employers came, learned a lot about the program. We tried to demystify the program. A lot of employers think, oh, it's too hard. It's you know a, a burdensome. It's not burdensome and you end up with an excellent trained workforce. So it was fabulous. The feedback we got was very, very helpful. And one of the things we learned was that people want us to do these regionally. So we are going to embark this year on doing summits in regions so that people can really dig into the issues with the people that they know from their region. We're going to reach out to all the REDCs and have conversations with them about apprenticeship because that's actually a really great nexus. The Regional Economic Development Councils are working on the economic development plan for that region. What better way? to help them secure their, their pipeline of talent than to talk to them about establishing apprenticeships in those industries. Um, it is uh, an ambitious agenda, and, um, and I think that Jane and I and the entire staff in the apprenticeship program are up to it. And I know that we'll be reaching out to you when we come to the regions to have you come and help us talk to these prospective employers. Uh, it, we, we don't do this alone. I mean, you know, when I was president of my union, I always used to say I'm, I was just the crazy redhead at the front of the room if I didn't have my, my fellow you know, brothers and sisters in the union supporting me. And I feel the same way about apprenticeship. I can you know, pound the table and make pronouncements all I want, but it's your support and your thinking and your hard work, frankly, that makes it so successful. 
So thank you for being here. Thank you for all the work that you do. And I want to echo uh, Esther's beautiful opening. Uh, only the best wishes for next year. It's going to be a better, brighter year, I hope. Um, have a wonderful, wonderful holiday with your family. And of course, a happy Festivus for the rest of us. <laughs> and there will be an airing of grievances later. <laughs> we have a Festivus poll, but I forgot to bring it down with me, so. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Roberta. Yes. Um, Jane, uh, you're up next with your report. Uh, so I may repeat a little bit of what uh, the commissioner said, but um, forgive me for that. But um, uh, we have a lot of the, after spending a week together in the car, we tend to have some of the same ideas. Um, is, this, is this too loud? Am I? No, okay. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thank you. Happy December. Thanks for being here. Um, so the beginning part of my director's report, I'm just um, going to show some photos. Like, it's slower than what the video was, but just... Um, so we just a couple of pictures. Here's the commissioner address and the lieutenant governor addressing our summit. As the commissioner mentioned, um, this was great for bringing uh, new folks in to learn about what apprenticeship is. I think there's a lot of myths out there about what apprenticeship <coughs> is, who it's for, who can do it, who can work in the summit. Really goes a long way to helping us branch out um, into some of these new industries that are really looking for um, help to train their workforce and fill their skilled jobs. And um, I just wanted, I don't think he could be here today, but you see in the gray jacket, Sean Brennan uh, from the Mason Tenders um, District Council came and uh, helped talk about how he runs his program and, and some of the uh, wonderful ways that the construction trade, construction industry has used apprenticeship and how we can translate that into other industries. So it was a, a great uh, success. And then I do have some photos from uh, National Apprenticeship Week. Um, uh, forgive me, I'm just gonna remember where we were. So we started off, you can, you'll be able to trace through with us for those of you who wish that you could be, be with us. Um, we started off in Western New York and Chautauqua at the uh, uh, Painters, I, uh, International <coughs> Union of Painters and Allied Trades, uh, District Council 4. And uh, keep this in mind, uh, we're going to be doing this again next year, I presume. Lee, I'm assuming there'll be a National Apprenticeship Week next week, next year, so uh, invite us. You'll get um, your photo and your video up, um, and uh, a great proclamation. You'll see in a lot of the photos uh, the commissioner bringing a proclamation for uh, to these sponsors just to thank them for their investment in the New York State workforce and their commitment to registered apprenticeship. Um, so after Chautauqua, we went up to Niagara Falls and saw the folks at Labor's Local 91. That's not a great photo of me, so if you're <laughs> pulling these from any place, I ask that you not necessarily use that particular one. Um, uh, it's very stern. Yeah. Um, so then we hopped over to Rochester, uh, where we got to tour um, a, a food processor producer called Love Beats. Uh, maybe many of you have seen those in your grocery stores, I saw them uh, at Costco when I was there the other day, um, and they have, they're part of one of our new group manufacturing programs uh, through the Rochester, RTMA, the Rochester Technology and Manufacturing Association. Um, they host, they have two different apprenticeship programs, the electrical, me electro mechanical technician and the industrial manufacturing <laughs> technician. Um, and we just, this is one of the apprentices there. We did, I know, we did. <laughs> I do suggest that you use this picture everywhere you go. <laughs> um, no, but it was great. Um, this tour, the apprentices brought us around. That's the other apprentice there um, in the red hat. They uh, brought us around the plant, explained to us exactly how they went from, and they were actually, it was great because they had beets from New York at that particular time, so it was a New York product uh, being uh, uh, manipulated in New York, so it was great to see that. And then we stayed in Rochester, and uh, Unicon yep. did a, um, a great uh, apprenticeship. They had a, opened up, they had one day at the Laborers Union Hall, all the different trades in Rochester came together and took applications. They brought in um, students and other members of the community to sign up for their apprenticeship program. Uh, there you see us with some folks from uh, who came through their direct entry program called MAP, 
uh, and Harry Bronson, the assemblyman from the area, who is a real champion of registered apprenticeship, is an elected official who really understands how apprenticeship works, what the benefit is, and, and he's been a real champion for us. So um, I think we just have a couple of photos from there. Um, I think I mentioned the uh, Lieutenant Governor was there with us as well, so that was great. Um, and then we stayed in that area and we went to Ontario um, to see Optimax, um, which has a, its own standalone program in, and I'm going to get this wrong, hold on, I wrote it down, a precision optics manufacturing technician. Um, really kind of neat, they make lenses for all different um, kinds of products. They do even some stuff with the military, um, so they have to keep some things secret. But um, what's, what's, what I'm always struck about is whenever I go and tour um, facilities with the commissioners, how much I really don't understand how anything works. Um, and seeing these kinds of, like the precision optics and how they're made and what they're used for and how many um, you know, just different things, and it's always, um, as I said, realize um, that they don't, I don't really know how anything works. Um, what's great is Optimax is also expanding, so it's just a great New York story. Um, a lot of um, companies that we saw, um, they really are expanding. That's one of the reasons why they're looking to a registered apprenticeship to increase their workforce um, and uh, growing larger, so that's great. And, in every place we went, we got to sit down and talk to apprentices and hear about their experiences and talk with the sponsors about um, how it works for them and, and how it can be better. And then we went into Liverpool, which is just outside of Syracuse, for those of you not familiar with uh, Central New York, and we visited uh, JMA Wireless. Um, this is, it's like, I can't remember. It's a sound deadening. It's a sound room, deadening room, so that way, that, that, that um, uh, yeah, those, um, Roberta tried to push me into those, but they were soft, so it softened my blow. Um, but it's like, because any kind of vibration is gonna make that uh, laser up above move. Again, I don't know how anything works, but they have both a toolmaker apprenticeship program and a CNC machinist. Um, and again, we got to meet with some of the workers um, and uh, really kind of see how these programs, uh, this is another uh, business that's expanding in central New York um, and really expanding its footprint and again using registered apprenticeship to do that. And then we came into Albany and the IBEW was doing their annual um, trainers summit uh, at the, um, here at a hotel in Albany. And uh, we had the great honor, we got to meet with all the trainers and see folks from the industry. Um, I don't think we have a photo of it, but we were able to give uh, Craig Jacobs, uh, who's retired, a nice proclamation um, upon his retirement. So that was fun when we get to, uh, you know, he's been a trainer and in the business for a while. So um, nice to see that. And then we ended up down in the, uh, in the Hudson Valley in New Paltz. Um, this is a company, Viking Industries. They make cord, 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 corrugated, am I saying that right? Corrugated cardboard, it doesn't sound right to me. Um, and again, they're part of one of our um, group programs, uh, Council of Industry, um, and they have a program in, uh, I wanna say it's, um, uh, oh my gosh, it just went right out of my head. I think maybe it's industrial manufacturing technician. Um, but got to see how, you know, different things that go into making cardboards. They're the ones that had the really neat, where um, the commissioner was putting her hand in the dragon. They had made that for a fun thing that they do as staff with like a dragon it's like on top of a boat uh, that they had to float across a river or something. Um, so, uh, and again, What's nice about this story, and this is The Apprentice, um, he came on, he is actually, his journey worker is his dad. Um, so his dad is the one passing down the skills, so it's a really nice kind of family story. Um, and he was already working at the company when they had the registered apprenticeship program, and they actually said it's almost easier to have that father-son relationship with the kind of structure of the registered apprenticeship program as opposed to just a father telling his son this is what you need to do. It's like, no, I'm telling you this because it's in the training outline and you need to learn this and it's not just me saying it, it's the state of New York um, who is telling you that this is what you need to learn. So they're just, as I said, it's just really great stories and then we ended 
in Long Island City. Um, it just was at dusk, there was the lighting, the sky, it was really, and it was just wonderful to see um, all of these, um, you know, surrounded by women who were doing this uh, apprenticeship work. They clearly love what they do. Um, here's some of the top leadership of local, of the Mason tenders. Um, and it's just, you know, lovely to see um, women really kind of embracing, so it was a great day. This was, um, this, thir this was on Thursday, and that was, uh, within National Apprenticeship Week was dubbed as uh, Women in Apprenticeship Day, so it was a, a great way to end our tour. So um, the one thing I do want to say, if you guys are not following us on one of various social media platforms, I would really encourage you to do that. Um, I don't think we've ever had as good slides. Uh, you saw the video. We have a really great communications team, um, and if you follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, Instagram, thank you. Um, you know, any of those, you'll see lots of really great photos of what the commissioner's doing, not only around apprenticeship, but other things that we're doing at the Department of Labor. And um, I'm very lucky that the commissioner is often doing something about apprenticeship. You know, we've had, I'm gonna go into some of our data for um, 2019, and I do just have to say, um, I'm very lucky here in New York uh, with registered apprenticeship. I have a, a commissioner, and a boss, Karen, who really puts in the time and effort and resources to make sure that I have a really great team. Um, I do have one of the best, you know, I'm the one sitting up here, I think I say this to everyone all the time, but it's really my staff that's here in the audience um, that, you know, gets me through. They're really the ones who know what they're doing. I just tell you what they tell me to, I tell you guys what they tell me to say. Um, so I'm very lucky kind of with my apprenticeship staff and with the support I get from um, at the Department of Labor and from the council members um, and I think that's really what's helped us grow a lot so I do just want to give a little say thank you to everyone so where are we as of today I know this is why everyone comes we want to know so as of yesterday um, we're up to we're so close to 600 uh, different sponsors we're at 596 sponsors uh, with 878 programs. Uh, right now we have 18,314 active apprentices. Um, particularly with apprentices, right, those are, that's just the number as of yesterday. Everyone knows apprentices are constantly in and out of programs. Some are added, some are graduated, um, and that number fluctuates more than any of them, but this is where we are as of yesterday. So. What's really nice is that uh, so far in 2019, we've issued 3,194 certificates of completion, uh, which is great. That's you know almost 3,200 um, apprentices that have moved on to their um, out of their program with those skills. And what I love to see is that number is up by almost 700 over what we did in 2018. Um, so. I think I did the math right there, but so that's a um, love to see that that number growing because it just means that, you know, as I said, apprentices are finishing the programs, they have their portable certificate, they've learned their skills, and now they're um, even more productive members of their employer's teams. Um, again, love to show this graph. It's constantly moving up from December 2013. In the last six years, we've seen um, a growth of 200 programs, right, from 673 to, um, 878 now and our sponsors have gone up from 500 to 586 so those numbers are constantly growing and I do have to say um, what this doesn't reflect it, we're even a little bit bigger than, than what we're showing because as I mentioned we do have these manufacturing group programs we have four of them in the state um, and between them that so they only count as one program each right or four programs altogether, but they really have, um, they sponsor together 34 different trades for their manufacturing members, and they have 80 signatories between the four of them who are, you know, working with, participating in that apprenticeship program. So while um, they only are showing up in my data as four, those are actually 80 new um, manufacturers, uh, you know, employers who are participating in registered apprenticeship. So um, it's it's a little bit bigger than we show, but we don't show all of, you know, in the construction trades, there are thousands of signatories who are participating. Um, but I just like to point out about that, about the manufacturing. 
So here you can see um, our new, how many new programs we've um, approved in this year. Um, we uh, started, so this year, as of yesterday, we've approved 111 new programs, um, which is up over from uh, up 10 from last year, um, which is really up by, you know, 60 programs uh, back just in 2016. So we've seen a really a lot of growth. Um, and again, 73 of those programs are in trades other than construction. So again, that's about, that puts us at about a 65, I think, 67% of those are in trades other than construction. So um, again, really seeing our efforts at growing um, beyond construction, really bringing this model into other sectors, really kind of taking off. So um, yeah, it's 66% um, is this year. So that is great. And uh, in the state of the state, last year, the state of the state, the governor gave us a charge to um, double the number of apprenticeships in high demand fields um, by 2024, I believe it is, and I think at this pace we're gonna meet that goal um, even sooner than, than the uh, time frame he gave us. So that's, that's nice to see. Um, so uh, just kind of showing you guys um, which I think is an also an interesting statistic of how many new <coughs> apprentices come into our programs each year. So December of 2014 was particularly high coming off of 2013, but we've also, so that's a little bit of an anomaly, but we've seen that number really grow since 2013 in terms of how many apprentices are coming in. We had a real high mark last year with nearly 6,000 apprentices coming into our programs. Um, this year, as of yesterday, we're at about 5,500, so a little bit less than last year, but keep in mind, once uh, an apprentice comes in and signs, a, signs an AT401 with you, we have 30 days, you have 30 days to get those to us, so um, that number will probably be bigger um, in January when the last of 2019 401s have come in. Um, but again, that's just also just a nice number to see um, how that grows in terms of who's who's able to come into the programs. Um, oh, so I'm sorry. This is um, active apprentices by trade. So you can, again, like to see that number in trades other than construction. Obviously, our construction programs are our um, biggest number of apprentices, um, but uh, we are seeing steady growth in our apprentices outside in other trades outside of construction. Um, and it continues to grow, you know, it was started off, it, we're up to about 20% of those, um, and that number's been growing. Um, do you just wanna like to show you guys how you're doing with your underserved populations, minorities, women, and veterans? Um, we're holding fairly steady on those numbers between 2018 and 2019. Um, about in December of last year, about 44% of our Apprentices were minorities that ticked down just 1% to 43. Um, but again, these are just kind of numbers in time. And this, my PowerPoint always goes up on the website after the meeting. So, um, so anyway, so you can get these numbers um, there as well. Um, unfortunately, we have seen women tick down just a little bit. But again, it's, it's a point in time. Um, you know, I think uh, some programs had just. Uh, I think those are coming in, and I think you'll see it next, we'll see it in, that's not necessarily in the construction trades, but that's in, because of a, trades other than construction have dipped down a little bit this year. But points in time, but good to know, we did go up by one percentage point from 2018 to 2019 with veterans, um, so that's great. We did, just before Registered Apprenticeship Week started on that Friday, the commissioner and I attended the Helmets to Hard Hats luncheon uh, which has it's mainly concentrated in New York City, but now has folks in Buffalo and Albany that are really helping match veterans who are coming back from service with apprenticeship programs through that direct, direct entry program. And I'm guessing that some of that growth in veterans is due to their increased activities in other parts of the state. Um, so, so again, just breaking down, those last slide was the total numbers, but you can see we have 40% of, of uh, our construction apprentices are minorities. 
um, whereas 55% uh, are in trades other than construction. Um, women in construction has held fairly steady at 7%, um, and it's gone down, that's where it's, it went from like 33% to 32% in trades other than construction. And then again, our veterans are 8% construction and 5% uh, non. Um, so this is just some interesting data. The one thing I will say is um, a couple years ago we had done for all of our programs uh, letters to let you know how you were doing on your EEO goals as laid out in your affirmative action plans. Uh, we're getting ready to mail out another round of those letters, so hopefully if you weren't meeting your goals, you've taken the necessary steps to um, bring you closer to those goals. As a reminder, goals are set by, um, within your affirmative action plan, with which counties you're recruiting from. So every program in this room is gonna have a slightly different goal, kind of gonna just depend on what your recruitment area is. Um, some of you may have three counties that you're pulling from, some may have 10. Um, that's all just gonna fluctuate depending on what the census data is. But um, we're gonna do those letters so you have your next benchmark of where you're doing, how you're doing as you're looking to recruit in 2019 for new apprentices. I really encourage you to look at those numbers um, and think about what you can do to uh, bring yourself closer to meeting them if you're not meeting your goals. Um, what steps can you take? You know, work with your ATR to really look at uh, where you're recruiting from. Are there some new sources that you could do, go to? Are there new um, places that you could advertise? Uh, is there a new way that you could be taking in your apprentices? Is there a new, um, a different recruitment, recruitment method that might be better um, for you? Are you really utilizing whatever direct entry programs are available in your area? Um, but I just, anyway, I really encourage you as we do those letters, sit down with your ATRs, look at them, and figure out if, if you're not at uh, meeting those goals, how you can do better to meet them, work with us, and uh, tell us how we can help you um, do that. But your ATRs are your first great source, and then if, you know, and then come to us also if you have some other ideas, and open for some of you that are, are doing great um, and really meeting your goals year after year. Um, we'd love to hear some of your best practices. Um, you know, what are some things that have worked um, for getting those apprentices in? So we'll look at that in 2019. Um, so that's the end of my slides, but I do just have a couple other um, housekeeping items that I want to just remind you guys of. And I'm sorry, I wrote everything down in a different piece of paper, so. Forgive me. Um, I just want to mention, uh, I talked about your a, your affirmative action plans. Uh, we are still operating under our same EEO regulations. We have not uh, had our new regulations approved by the feds, so that the U, uh, USDOL Office of Apprenticeship to uh, begin to roll out the new uh, regulations. Um, so I, I know that's a topic that comes up sometimes. It's been a little bit of time that we've been waiting for that. Um, I'm sure Lee will let folks know back at, that we, we talked about it and asked about it. Um, but again, we know that they're coming. So I would really kind of um, behoove yourself to think about, uh, particularly I think the, the new goal in there is uh, folks with disabilities. Um, I, you know, think about how that can be accommodated. Um, it's a self-reporting mechanism. We'll need to roll out some new forms when and not when we do that. Um, and maybe at the March meeting, um, our next meeting, I can bring someone in who can really talk about what it means. You know, we can really kind of dig into what it means to, um, what it means, I think a lot of questions I get are like, what does that mean some, to hiring someone with a disability? Um, and maybe we can kind of have that kind of broader conversation um, as we enter into 2019. Um, so that way you know kind of what that means for you, and I think it's easier than, um, I'm sorry, 2020, I'm going back in time. <laughs> We're gonna go back and relive 2019 all over again, um, 2000, as we enter into 2020. Um, but that's certainly something that we can start to have those conversations, and it's something that I think that we in this room should all think about how we do in our program, even though ahead of having um, our new EEO regs approved by the USDOL. So there's that. I um, want to also mention, we spent some time in this room talking about 
uh, what's commonly known as the IRAPs, the Industry Recognized Apprenticeship Programs that uh, the administration was rolling out um, as a kind of almost like a parallel track to our state registered or, or federally registered apprenticeship programs. These were gonna be overseen by industry sectors that were, um, that were given certification status by the US DOL. They rolled out, rolled out some regulations uh, back in September that were overseeing that. They were um, flooded with uh, responses to those, um, uh, to those regulations, um, I think by many of you in this room. Um, I've heard anywhere from 500,000 to 600,000 responses. Um, just to give you some context, what I've been told is when they rolled out new WIOA regulations, they get about 5,000 comments. So this was definitely a topic that everyone was very, very interested in. We're, we're a little bit on pause because they need to go through, as part of the regulatory process, they need to go through all those comments um, and classify them and, and figure out what they're doing with them. So we're in a lengthy hold. You know, we will stay on top of it and watch it and, and see what other um, action comes out of it, um, but for right now, we can rest a little bit easy. They're, they're not coming anytime soon, um, but uh, they are, on, as it's been described to me, on, on pause. So, um, so that's, in my opinion, good news. Um, I think that the, one of the best things about registered apprenticeship is the kind of the structure and the state-issued certificate for the apprentices. Um, I was not necessarily in favor of them, in my humble opinion, I think that most of you in this room agree with me. Um, so, so anyway, so I'm I'm happy that there was that response, and we're able to kind of take our breath and and really focus on the registered apprenticeship. Um, I, I think I reminded everyone about this before, but I'm going to say it again and again and again. Uh, we are now in our second year five of our of our recertification process. We're in, you know. Everyone should now be about to be going through their second time of being going through the recertification process. For many of you, that's um, for many who are in that last year of that year, that are bigger programs. Um, the first time you went through it, you gave us your signatory list. We do not want you when you go through the when you go through the um, uh, recertification process. We don't want you to give us that list again. What you should be doing, what you're According to the regulations, what you need to be doing is when a new signatory, com signatory comes onto your program, you need to tell us within 90 days. Uh, and that's for folks who are coming on and folks who are coming off. Um, so that's a regulation. That's how uh, you know, the signatory list is kept. Um, but let me tell you the other really practical reason why you need to do that is municipalities and other letting agencies all the time will call up, will email us and say, can you verify that this particular contractor is part of a registered apprenticeship program? If we don't have your contractors on as signatory, I have to say no. So um, we've had one instance where there was a program that didn't let us know about a signatory. We needed, we couldn't, it was, you know, past the 90 days, there was nothing we could do and those apprentices needed to be paid as journey workers. <coughs> Because if we don't know that a signatory, if we don't know about a signatory, we can't verify it. So um, never mind that it's a regulation that this is, you know, you're supposed to be telling us about signatories who come on within 90 days for a really practical reason. I don't want that to happen to any of you in this room where you do have someone who has signed on to your CBA, your, they're your signatory, or, you know, or signed on to your program and we don't know about it and we can't verify it. So I really can't stress enough. I know it can be a little bit of a pain, but you have to figure out with your you know, offices, whoever is coming on and signing on to your program, how, you know, even if it's once a quarter, you send us anyone new, if there's someone who's you know, a contractor that you found to be bad and you've taken them off of your list, let us know that as well. We don't want to, um, ever have to say that someone who is partici participating in a program is not. So um, really just kind of encourage you to figure out how you can do that um, and get us those signatories within every 90 days. And then for every recertification, you don't have to go back through um, that whole kind of getting us the entire list again. Any questions on that piece? 
and then I'm just going to do just one more. Do I have a couple more minutes? Just, so we, um, I just think this is a great story about um, registered apprenticeship and why sectors outside of construction really want to participate in it, and um, and just kind of a real uh, a kudos to our partnership, right? So we've had a really strong partnership over the last few years with SUNY. SUNY's really helped us grow in the healthcare trades and in the advanced manufacturing. When I first started this job, however many years ago, last year I think it was that I started, um, we had one healthcare program, it was a direct support professional um, New Horizons out of the Hudson Valley, and they were great. And actually, I think my very first meeting, uh, they had been using a time-based uh, training outline, and they switched to competency. So it was like, ooh, our one healthcare program and our one competency-based program. Um, we've had a really strong partnership with um, SUNY. We've really, and in the last year, we've had five or six different um, agencies that have come on, specifically in the capital region, um, to do registered apprenticeship for direct support professional. Um, and one of the things that one of the sponsors had said was, what's great about registered apprenticeship, you know, this is, a, we're having, it's, everyone's having the same trouble recruiting, right? I mean, it's a really tight job market. We're at one of the lowest um, unemployment rate that we've seen in a while. Um, and, and, you know, direct support professionals are really, can be a really tough job. It can be really hard to recruit and retain. And one of the things that one of the sponsors said to me is like, it's really quite, a, it's a way that I can professionalize the, this particular job. It's not just like, hey, come be a direct support professional now. It's a way that I can, it, there's a training outline, there's skills, there's education attached, there's a credential at the end. It, it, it's, it's really helping us, it helps us attract because hey, look, you're gonna get these, some of these benefits. Not that it's easy, you know, it's never easy to attract for some of these, but, <coughs> But that's just what registered apprenticeship can do. You may already be doing some of this training, but coming in and saying like, this is a this is a field that I really just want to add some some oomph to, and then you get that with the training outlines, you get it with the credential, with the state stamp of approval, on any of those things, and then they have to do the related instruction. So it's a step towards, you know, they're getting that education at SUNY Schenectady, or one of the other SUNY campuses, and that's. You know, it's all just a benefit, and it's a benefit for the employers, and it's a benefit for the apprentices, and I just love that story because it's really, um, it, to me, it just kind of capitulate, capitulate, capsulates a lot of what we've been doing in this past year, which is reaching out to em new employers, helping industry see the benefits of registered apprenticeship that a lot of you in this room have seen. <laughs> you know, a lot of your programs have been around for, uh, you know, 50, 100 years in one form or another. Um, and also just kind of helping folks in a particular industry be even better in that industry. So um, I end with that kind of great story and it's one that I love about why this expansion that um, I've, we've been allowed to take on and, and really given the resources to take on is really important to us for, feel, for every single sector and why the commissioner, everyone that she talks to is convinced, she's convinced that every <coughs> single employer in the state of New York should have some sort of registered apprenticeship program and she is gonna talk to every single one of them until they do. Um, and, but it's great because it's having those conversations and, and we're gonna, my staff is dedicated to doing whatever it takes to making sure that these new program sponsors have the experience they need and how do we work with you to make sure that registered apprenticeship is working for you and with you. So. I don't know, and with that just kind of, I, I love that story, I love the way that that's worked, and, and that, so I just kind of end there. Thank you, Jane. Does anybody have questions for Jane on her presentation? We have open questions at the end, but are there questions about the presentation, about IRAP, any question about that at all? Um, Jane, if you yeah. could though, as things progress on the federal level, since it is such a danger to re registered apprentice programs, because it will be an employer deciding the criteria, employer deciding that this, they're gonna have an apprentice program without the same kind of regulation that we have now, mm -hmm. without making sure that criteria are actually met and that people are actually being trained and trained properly. If you could keep the community up mm -hmm. to date on what's happening, because it, unless you're reading the Federal Register, yep. which I don't think most of us do, um, we won't know what's happening on the federal level. And so it would be important if you could keep us surprised. Sure. And I would ask all of you to reach out to your members of House of Representatives and the Senate 
because I'm sure they don't understand exactly what this is going to mean for registered apprentice programs. And so this is an, an important area for New York because it will certainly impact our programs here in New York and what we can do to maintain the quality of our apprentice program. So if you could do that for us, Jane, I'd really appreciate it. Definitely, Thank I will. You. And I will say, um, and again, this is kind of anecdotal, I don't have, really, but I, I think there were some members of Congress who actually did understand and were some of the, some of the folks who wrote letters in about, uh, some, some of those were co some of the comments and uh, members of Congress have really, who have over the last few years appropriated funds to help registered apprenticeship. I think they've really seen IRAPS as maybe not as helpful. They, they might have a similar view and, and I think that that's been helpful um, to the IRAP conversation. Great, thank you. Yeah, we have a question. Would you come to the podium, please? I'm sorry. Um, and tell us who you are. We have a few minutes for questions, sorry. so thank you. Uh, Penny Hayes from Merit Apprenticeship Alliance. Uh, to the issue of IRAPS, is it possible at all for there to be sort of a listing of the critical issues? So if we are reaching out to our legislators, that we can sort of encapsulate what those critical points are, make sure we're all on the same page. Because sure. I know from my perspective, I did try to read some of it, and my brain went dull. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, God. And, and I really couldn't do much more than just say, I don't think this is a good thing. Right? Yeah. So if we could get that, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Definitely. Great suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else before we take a break? OK. Uh, we're a little ahead of schedule, so we'll do a little ahead of schedule break. Um, it's now, we have usually have 15 minutes for a break, so our break will come back at, uh, actually, let's make it 11.35. Thank you all very much for coming back. So we have uh, some new trades um, and a trade reactivization that we would like to uh, discuss with you and then hopefully have the council take a vote. And so um, Leif, um, if you could come to the fore and talk about the new trades we have and then we'll do the trade activization, the activization. Good morning. Uh, the, the first trade we're going uh, to present is the narrow web flexographic press operator. This is a time-based uh, apprenticeship, and the proposal comes to us from Syracuse Label and Surround Printing, located in North Syracuse, New York. Uh, this is a 100% uh, employee-owned company. They operate in a facility that up until last year was about 60,000 feet uh, square feet. Uh, thanks to a grant from REDC and Empire State Development, they're about to finish a 23,000 square foot addition, which is going to accommodate more uh, storage, warehousing, and equipment. So um, they're on the move. Um, they provide flexographic printing solutions with a product portfolio that includes shrink sleeves, flexible packaging, and other custom made printed products used in a variety of industries, including pharmaceutical, cosmetic, and food and beverage. While there's probably nobody here that drinks alcoholic beverages, if you are familiar with the 1911 brand uh, hard cider, BB Skiff, those labels are made by Syracuse Label and Surround. And then, because we're all healthy, uh, the burned dairy shrink sleeves, when you go to the convenience stores, those uh, shrink sleeve labels are made at Syracuse Label and Surround as well. Uh, major job duties include complying with all company, company safety rules and regulations, maintaining a neat and orderly work area, interpreting work instructions to obtain, obtain job details and specifications, verifying that paper and ink meet the specification for a given job, selecting, inspecting, and installing plate cylinders, analox rolls, film stock, and inks, feeding paper through press cylinders and adjusting feed and tension controls, operating presses, inspecting random samples during print runs, to identify any issues and make necessary adjustments, changing press plates or cylinders, and cleaning in ink fountains, plates, or printing unit cylinders. So for those of you who don't know what flexographic printing is, it's sort of, it's not even that new, but we tend to think of lithography, which is a hard plate, right, used to transfer an image. Flexography is that plate, but it's flexible. So it's like a big piece of rubber that's, um, 
there's a lot of pre-production stuff that goes into planning. Each, each portion of the plate deposits a certain amount of ink of a particular color on a label that winds up on your sterilite container. So it's pretty com it's a it's a very neat process to see uh, working, um, and these guys are very good at it. So the proposed length is 4,000 on-the-job training hours with a minimum of 288 hours of related instruction for each apprentice. The ratio for the trade is one apprentice to one journey worker, followed by one apprentice to one journey worker. <coughs> On May 14, 2019, the draft training outline was posted on the New York State Department of Labor website as required, and public comments were solicited. Uh, to date, we have received no comments. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Oh. Any questions? Council, any questions? Can I have a motion? motion. Second, to accept. Can I say it's unanimous? Yes. yes. Thank you. Next trade. Okay. Now we're moving on to junior accountant, um, or as I called it colloquially, uh, bookkeeper on steroids. <laughs> uh, this is a time-based proposal that comes to us from Taxes R Us, a financial services company located in Kingston, New York. The trade under consideration is part of an occupational group, which is bookkeeping, accounting, and auditing clerks, which is projected to have modest employment growth statewide over the next 10 years, and a mean annual salary of $46,700. So uh, not a bad mean salary. Major job duties include accessing computerized financial information to answer general and account-specific questions, utilizing enterprise resource planning systems, if applicable, effectively using various types of accounting software, reviewing and analyzing documents and reports and ensuring the confidentiality of information, recording and reconciling balance sheets, income statements, and other financial reports, assisting with analysis of expense, payroll, and other accounts, aiding senior accountants in reconciliation of monthly, quarterly, and yearly financial reports, performing financial calculations such as amounts due, interest, balances, equity, and principal, and then preparing and filing tax returns. Uh, interestingly enough, the sort of the, the, the proposed length is 4,000 on the job training hours. This particular sponsor was clear that um, part of the reason for that duration was that people really needed to have two full tax seasons um, as part of this apprenticeship, that that was uh, they couldn't get enough experience in one tax season. So uh, there's a minimum of 288 hours of related instruction for each apprentice, and the ratio for the trade is one apprentice to one journey worker, followed by one apprentice to one journey worker. On August 22, 2019, the draft training outline was posted on the New York State Department of Labor website as required. Public comments were solicited. To date, we have received no comments. Um, I just want to point out that the outline presented for consideration today differs from the 822-19 posting as follows. Uh, two topics have been added to Appendix B. Um, one of the things we do when we create new trades or reactivate trades is New York State Education Department is responsible for determining the appropriateness of Appendix B. They get to review the outline in draft form and then issue their determination. So based on conversations with them, back and forth with the prospective sponsor, it was determined that accounting software and business ethics were two topics that were lacking in the original um, and that both the sponsor and state ed uh, felt were important to be included. And that's it for that one. Thank you. Any questions from the community? Council, any questions? Can I have a motion? Can I second? Can I say it's unanimous? Yes. Okay. It's passed. Okay, next. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next trade is uh, CNC Sawyer. This trade proposal is from Johnston and Rhodes Bluestone Company from East Branch, New York, and Delaware County. Johnston and Rhodes has been quarrying, fabricating, and distributing bluestone since 1900. The bluestone mine at Johnston and Rhodes is exclusive to South Central New York and Northeast Pennsylvania and cannot be found commercially anywhere else in the United States or Canada. I didn't realize that until we. Uh, myself and a former coworker went out and performed a, a job study. Um, there's literally a band that stretches Delaware County, probably, a, a, I guess it's a 90 mile radius around Deposit, New York. That's where virtually all the um, 
commercially available bluestone is uh, in the U.S. and Canada. So it's nice to be a part of a state that has lots of bluestone. All right, major job duties include developing familiarity with materials. In the case of Johnston and Rhodes, it's bluestone. It could be, the substrate could be plastic, could be wood, um, but either way they have to develop a familiarity with the materials and their characteristics. Readying material for use, transporting it to the appropriate shop floor locations, prepping material prior to work, and placing material on work tables. Reading and interpreting job orders, demonstrating an understanding of spec sheets and blueprints, learning the basics of computer numerical control coordinate systems, demonstrating knowledge of CNC program elements. Typically there's three main parts to a program. The start of the program, the portion of the program when the material is removed, and then the actual ending of the program. Becoming familiar with basic components of a CNC saw, inputting computer-aided design programs, <coughs> making production runs, and troubleshooting production issues. The proposed length is 2,500 on the job training hours with a minimum of 180 hours of related instruction for each apprentice, 144 of which must be provided in the first year. The ratio for the trade is one apprentice to one journey worker, followed by one apprentice to one journey worker. On September 6th, the draft training outline was posted on the Nisdall website as required, and public comments were solicited. To date, we have received no comments. Similar to the prior trade, the outline presented for consideration today differs from the 9619 posting as follows. On the Appendix B, uh, we added the words including speeds and feeds to the Appendix B topic trade math. Um, it's a, anybody who's got any familiarity with CNC stuff in, in production facilities, uh, the rate at which material is fed through whatever is, is doing the the machining um, is a big part of the trade map that folks need to know, and uh, it was felt that that was important enough to call out sp specifically. So that's the difference in that outline. And that's it for that trade. Any questions? Could you um, come to the, so we could all hear, thank you, and just tell us who you are. Yeah, Larry Warzik, Local 83 Chief Metals. Could you give us the rate of pay that the uh, yearly salary would be? I, I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, they've applied for a program. Um, I think whatever the, the wage progression is, it's on, it's on our webpage under program pending approval. <coughs> I'm sorry, and that will vary, yes, I'm sorry, the, the pay will vary by program, right? So it'll be it, whoever, so it's not a set program, it's not a set pay rate for for this specific trade, it'll be whichever employer is using it will pay whatever they're paying. Okay. Does that make sense? I, I feel like I'm not articulate, but does that make, yeah. It varies. It varies. It varies. It'll, it'll vary by employer. Oh, posted rate then. Right. Yeah. Council, any questions? Can I have a motion? Second. Second. Can I say it's unanimous? Yes. Terrific. Thank you. Next. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to consider child care assistant. Um, uh, what I'm, I guess I designated this as the trade that may be called the trade formerly known as early childhood associate. So during trade development, with the help of the prospective sponsors, we decided a more appropriate title made sense, one which differentiates the work of this trade from any number of other early childhood occupations. Um, part of that is borne out in the fact that we've got an application from a program, Healthy Kids, uh, which runs after care programs. I can't even remember what the number is. Probably well, well in excess of 200 school districts. Um, have aftercare programs that Healthy Kids, uh, one of the program prospective sponsors, runs. And then we also have a more traditional time break based approach from uh, the Francisca Racker Center Incorporated. For those in the southern tier, uh, Tompkins County, it's in Ithaca, New York, and people refer to it as Racker. Uh, so we have prospective sponsors for both the competency and time based approach, but we're also presenting the hybrid today 
in the hopes that having all three approaches presented at once and uh, recommended for apprenticeability will make it that much easier for people to apply for programs. Uh, the major job duties include becoming familiar with New York State Office of Children and Family Services regulations, instructing children in safety rules and enforcing them consistently, something I have trouble with as a parent, identifying, treating, and reporting minor injuries and illnesses, recognizing indicators of possible abuse and maltreatment, and seeking resources for information and support, and following any applicable state laws in response. Providing a caring, bias-free climate that supports children's feelings of competence and self-worth, planning, scheduling, and implementing developmentally appropriate activities and routines, practicing active listening, communicating in a developmentally appropriate way, working in partnership with family members and establishing a rapport with family members. Uh, additionally, acting in a dependable, responsible manner in cooperation with others while caring for children in a variety of settings. So one thing that I sort of neglected was racker is your sort of what people typically think of as um, day, daycare or, um, my God, I paid for, for two kids, I the word escapes me. Um, Child care during the day, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the proposed lengths are as follows. For the time-based training outline, there's 3,500 on the job <coughs> training hours. Competency-based has a minimum of 1,000 to 2,000 on the job training hours. The hybrid has 3,000 <coughs> to 3,500 on the job training hours. And the related instruction requirements vary between approaches. Um, and that's just a function of the fact that if a competency is determined, the, the associated or related instruction hours aren't required to be uh, provided. On November 12, 2019, the draft training outlines were posted to the New York State Department of Labor website as required. And public comments were or, excuse me, and public comments are being solicited through December 12, 2019. To date, we have received no comments. So, with Thursday, um, will be the end of the comment period. And then one thing that I will. Uh, be changing that escaped my attention, my apologies, is that the competency-based approach references OCFS yeah. and work process A. The other two approaches still say DSS. I'm gonna change it to OCFS since OCFS is the umbrella for DSS. Minutia, I know, but it'll um, it's short consistency and I think a better naming convention. Any questions from the community? I just want to comment that um, OCFS <laughs> isn't the umbrella of DSS. I just I know in this we're making the structure, but um, the Office of Family and Children um, they are the ones that oversee and are responsible for certifying child care centers. Uh, so that's why that needs to be um, in alignment and to be corrected. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Um, are you asking us to do the to vote on this uh, and hold it in abeyance until we would vote today until the uh, last day of comments? We've done that before since the comment period is not completed yet. Yeah, I, yeah, I think the, yeah. Typi One day. Typi typically, unless there's a um, an avalanche of comments objecting that would change right the presentation or people's. Uh, opinion of it, yes. Okay, I just wanted it to be clear to everybody that and we're talking about one day, but nevertheless, I think it's important that we move forward. Do uh, you have a question, Stu? Yes. Um, did they indicate why they had three approaches? Do they plan on using all three or just keeping their options open? One program sponsor wants to use competency, a second sponsor wants to use time based. We don't have an applicant yet for hybrid. Um, you can't utilize more than one approach at the same time per our regs, so each uh, sponsor would have to select a single approach. <coughs> so we're trying to be all-encompassing and move this ahead so that it's there for everyone to be able to use the best in terms of their particular provider. Any other questions from the council? Can I have a motion? Second it. And it's unanimous. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you. Okay, the uh, final apprenticeable trade for consideration today is uh, the reactivation of the Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Counselor Aid. 
This reactivation comes particularly from Trinity Alliance of the Capital Region, a community services organization in Albany and New York, quote, known for its pioneering efforts in social service and health and wellness delivery, end quote. Um, so everybody is very familiar with the difficulties that we as a nation are having with, with alcohol and substance abuse. So there's just, just to put a little context to this, in 2017, it was estimated that 20 million people nationwide over the age of 12, um, of those people um, that needed treatment, only about 19% of those who needed it got it. Um, so there's a severe need um, for anybody that is willing to dive in and work with this population. And then on the same token, or a flip side, just yesterday Governor Cuomo announced that for the first time in 10 years outside of New York City, opioid overdose, overdose deaths among New Yorkers uh, have declined. So. It's nice to end the note on a, a, a positive note in that regard. So major job duties for this position include employing HIPAA rules regarding privacy and security, gathering and documenting relevant substance abuse history from clients, accurately assessing client problems by selecting, administering, scoring, and interpreting standardized instruments used to assess substance use disorders, documenting the client's psychological, social, and physiological signs and symptoms of substance use disorders in order to formulate a treatment plan, developing a recovery plan with client using appropriate counseling techniques to reduce the risk of relapse, using current literature, excuse me, current literature and research findings to educate individuals and others about the etiology and pathology of substance use disorders for recognizing warning signs and symptoms. Translating information about techniques, such as stress management, relaxation, communication, assertiveness, and refusal skills using appropriate methods so clients may improve their basic life skills. And keeping written records of group and individual counseling sessions. The proposed length of the trade is 2,000 on-the-job training hours with a minimum of 144 hours of related instruction for each apprentice. The ratio for the trade is one apprentice to one journey worker, followed by one apprentice to one journey worker. On August 29, 2019, the draft training outline was posted on the New York State Department of Labor website as required, and public comments were solicited. To date, we have received no comments. And you'll see a trend here. The difference between the original posting and the outline presented for consideration today is the addition of a topic in Appendix B, that is uh, written as general psychology, abnormal psychology, and developmental psychology. And again, that was something that worked uh, you know, in coordination between the prospective sponsors and New York State Education Department. Any questions from the community? How long had this trade been deactivated? Uh, you know, I, and I think it had been deactivated relatively recently, and to my knowledge, it was also a trade that was originally adopted uh, primarily for use in correctional facilities. But now it's obviously going to be available to anybody. Yeah. It also had been used at one point with the Office of um, Alcohol and Substance Abuse years ago is trying to develop um, you know, their own peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, and I know back in about 2009, and don't quote me exactly, but um, we did see there was some activity around that. Um, and then over the last couple of years, they haven't instituted the programs themselves. So we're pretty um, happy that people are coming back into this model for workforce development since it is such a need as we see every day in the newspaper. <clears throat> Any other questions, Council? Motion? Second? Yes. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you, Lake. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you, that's <coughs> great. These are really important moves forward. So Jane, you wanna sum up for us? Yeah, so one thing, this area? yeah, one thing that I didn't have in my slides just on data, which is um, exciting, is just, um, in addition, you know, we've just really, this office has created a lot of um, new trades for use for employers who are looking for registered apprenticeship. We um, developed them for one 
a particular employer who's come to us and then they're open for everyone to use. But in 2018, we rolled out seven new trades. Um, in 2019, we've already rolled out 16 new trades. Now, some of those might have been um, adopted or recommended by this council at the end of 2018, but still, that's, um, and then we have these uh, six new ones here today. And Leif tells me he has about 10 more that are in development. So we'll continue to see that trend in 2020 with new trades. Um, and we're averaging, you know, I'm trying to do those numbers, but you know, that's like nearly 30 over two years and, and we'll definitely uh, conceive that trend continuing. So just exciting that, you know, we have uh, an office that can create these new trades for employers who are looking to move into registered apprenticeship. Yeah. Yes, I just want to add that, uh, you know, I've been doing this a long time, as most of you know, and um, I do need to publicly thank our commissioner um, and Jane and her team. Um, it was always thought of as the building construction trade, which we know has the gold standard. It has been my mission for so many years to let other industries, sectors know the really important way we can develop a workforce through this model. I have worked here for 30 some years. I've never had a commissioner that has been so vigilant about getting out in every message to tell people that this is the way that we can have a learn and earn program. People need to work, but they need to be trained. And I publicly really feel the need to make sure that people understand what we have here as our commissioner. It's it's just has not been happening for a long, long time. And for me, in the workforce development end of it, I'm, I'm just in awe and I'm very happy. Thank you. Thank you, but again. Karen, Karen's just trying to get on our trip next year. I know, she, 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 she wants to be in the video. I know, I know how she rolls. But this is a group effort. This is a great example of when communities come together and put their minds and hearts together, the kind of great work that can come out of it. So thank you all. And it keeps apprenticeship current. And it keeps the skills in this state current because there's a skills mismatch here. And it's really going to hurt our economy in the state. And so this is just what we should be doing. It's really keeping up with what's happening in our economy and the changes that the workforce needs to meet and the structure of the economy keeps changing. And so that's what this is about. It's keeping up with how the structure of the economy changes. Now what we have to do is make sure our labor law and employment law follows and unfortunately, she can't do that. <laughs> but we're working on it. <laughs> you can talk to people. You know people? You can talk to people? Oh good. So this is the part of the agenda where you get to ask <coughs> questions. If there's something you want to let the commissioner or Jane, Karen, or council know that a uh, question you have about what you're doing, this is your time. Don't all run up at once. <coughs> the airing of the grievances, as we mentioned. We don't have the poll, but you can, <laughs> you can do it at, for the festivists, for the rest of us. Okay, so um, seeing that you don't have any questions, I would like to turn it over to Bill to talk a little bit about ESAC, which is such an important organization. Uh, thank you. Uh, ESAC, as you know, is the longest running uh, apprenticeship conference in the country. It was started back in June of 1944. Uh, this coming year, it'll be on May 11th. Uh, that's a Monday, and that's registration, and continue through the week. The location will be Harris Atlantic City. And uh, you can go to the ESAC website to uh, get your registration and everything else uh, in. And I'm also happy to announce that next year, in 2021, or actually the year after, uh, it's going to be in New York State, Niagara Falls, at the Seneca Casino. So, put that in your book. Uh, a lot of good information comes out. We, uh, we try to do our best uh, with the Standing Committee to come up with information uh, between the Standing Committee and the Planning Committee on uh, topics that are needed uh, for the apprenticeship uh, arena. And are also looking for if anybody has 
any thoughts on that, on what they would like to see, or uh, topics that they would like to hear that they can uh, go to the ESEC website and uh, do, do a posting on that. So this way we have not driven by us, but by driven by the apprenticeship community at large. All right, that's it. Uh, May 11th. Thank you, Bill. So I again want to thank all of you for coming um, and spending part of your day with us in beautiful Albany with all the beautiful snow, and there'll be a lot more, I'm sure. Um, I look forward to seeing you all in 2020. We are looking at dates now. We can't announce them yet because we have to clear everybody's calendar to make sure they work, but we are looking to schedule dates for March, June, September, and December. So again, I wish you a wonderful 2020 with all good things for you and your families, for our state, and for our country. Um, let's keep our country in our thoughts and minds since we seem to be having grave problems. Thank you so much. Drive safely home. Bye.